Hello everyone, welcome to my The Young and the Restless Homies official channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Heather reflected on her recent night of passion with Daniel as she dressed. Daniel entered the room, and things became a little awkward. Daniel inquired, What happens now? Heather replied, What do you want to happen? Heather told Daniel that she wanted to know how he felt after they had just made love and what it meant to him. Daniel said he made mistakes in Savannah and had tried to forget everything he had lost. Heather informed Daniel that she was all about the present and the future. Daniel said Lily deserved more from him. Heather reminded Daniel that he had said he wasn't yet in love with Lily. Daniel told Heather that he valued her honesty in telling him exactly what she wanted. It's me. I'm having trouble respecting myself right now, Daniel admitted. Heather continued to plead her case. We've been in love for many years. We have a child. We need to see if we have a chance, Heather told Daniel. She questioned Daniel about what he had with Lily because what he had shared, and could share again, with her. Heather told Daniel that she felt as close to him as ever, and that it was wonderful. Daniel couldn't dispute that it felt nice to him, but he also said that he'd never consider him and Heather being together again. Heather stated she couldn't be around Daniel without wanting to be with him. Daniel joked that he wasn't a jerk anymore. Heather told Daniel that she liked him so much that she would let him buy her a late lunch with no conditions attached. Abby asked Stephen in his office whether he could hire her or add her to the Chancellor Winter's board of directors, as she had recommended, to help protect the company from Tucker Bacall. Devin informed Abby that he had also considered having her join Chancellor Winters. Devin claimed that Abby would add a lot to the company besides another line of defense against Tucker, including good business counsel, honesty, and the capacity to tell Devan when he was wrong about anything. Abby told Devan it would be an honor to add to their son's legacy. Devin told Abby that he intended to recommend she be added to the board of directors, but he wanted to have a solid strategy in place before pitching the notion to Lily, Jill, and Billy. Devin invited Abby to lunch. Jack and Nikki arrived to the Abbott residence. Nikki admitted to drinking a few drinks and requested Jack to accompany her to an AA meeting. Absolutely, Jack agreed, but added that they needed to phone Victor first. Nikki objected. No, no, don't do that, she pleaded with Jack. Jack questioned Nikki about why she didn't want Victor to know what had transpired. Nikki described her slip-up as as minor as these things can be. Jack acknowledged that Nikki's decision to stop herself and get assistance was a step forward. But he warned that keeping Victor in the dark would include lies, cover-ups, and brushing problems under the rug, all of which were what kept addicts addicted. Nikki told Jack that Victor's continual checking in on her was driving her insane. Jack mentioned that it made it more difficult for Nikki to sneak a sip. It makes me feel claustrophobic and ashamed, Nikki explained. She told Jack that she despised the idea that, after so many years, her sobriety remained a problem. Nikki informed Jack that Victor had suggested a getaway for Nikki and himself. Jack suggested that a fresh setting would lead to a new viewpoint but Nikki realized she would simply be carrying her addiction with her. Nikki informed Jack that her meetings and support were in Geno City. Jack reminded Nikki that she needed a new sponsor and that Victor wouldn't mind. Nikki said, but he wouldn't want it to be you. Nikki told Jack that she didn't want to start again with a new sponsor because it would mean telling her story again and building trust with a new individual. No, Jack. I need you to get me out of this nightmare. Nikki insisted. Jack expressed gratitude for Nikki's faith in him. She asked if he could believe she knew how everything had to happen and that they needed to make sure Victor never found out. But Jack was suspicious. I'll just tell him I found a different sponsor, she said. Okay, good. We'll just continue the lie. Deceit is part of the disease, Jack informed Nikki. Nikki told Jack that finding a new sponsor would be too stressful for her so he decided to do it her way, for now. Jack informed Nikki that he suspected someone had forced alcohol on her. But he didn't know all the circumstances. 
Nikki added that some of the ordeal had been so harrowing that she had decided to spare Lauren many specifics. Nikki informed Jack about the newest member of the Newman family, as well as the circumstances of what had happened in Oregon. She described her experience with an IV vodka drip and how, once she identified what was going on, she realized Jordan knew precisely what she was doing. Jack recalled the anguish he'd watched as Victoria and Cole mourned what they thought was the death of their child. Jack pointed out that it could take years to repair Claire's psyche, and that it would be more difficult for Nikki to do all this while still dealing with her own recovery. I will be with you every step of the way, Jack told Nikki. Nikki told Jack that she went to the hospital to see Claire because she wanted to be alone with her, not knowing whether she would feel pity or wrath or whether she would trust Claire's promises about wanting to get better. Jack inquired about Nikki's takeaways from the visit. Nikki compared Claire to someone who had been drugged and fed lies her entire life, claiming Victoria and Cole had abandoned her and the Newman family had rejected her. Nikki stated about Jordan, she is evil incarnate. Jack was encouraged by Nikki's empathy for Claire. Nikki believed that forgiveness would come one day. But when Claire broke down, she couldn't bring herself to hug her granddaughter. Nikki told Jack that she felt guilty and upset, followed by self-pity for being in the situation at all. Nikki revealed that as soon as she left Claire's room, the memories of the kidnapping overpowered her, which is why she wanted a drink. Jack informed Nikki that calling him had been a very positive step and that he would be accessible to her at any time. Nikki requested Jack to swear that he would not tell Victor anything. Jack agreed. Nikki thanked him and intended to have her driver drive her back to the property. Victoria thanked Victor for their conversation and for trusting her judgment. Victor confirmed that if everything goes well, he will take Claire into the Newman family. Adam and Nick went in and heard the end of that conversation. Has Claire's situation changed? And what exactly does accept her into the family mean? Adam asked. But out, Victoria replied. She told Adam that he had no right to ask questions or express an opinion because he knew absolutely nothing about Claire. Adam insisted he knew enough to be concerned for their father and Victoria. Adam went on to say, Is it that impossible that I would want to protect the family from outside harm? Victoria responded, says the outsider who's always trying to claw his way back in. Adam admitted that he knew nothing about Claire and had never met her. Nick informed Adam, Your concerns have been acknowledged. Move on. Adam asked Nick if he was truly comfortable welcoming a mentally ill felon into the family with open arms. Victoria moved between them and exclaimed, That's enough. Victor silenced them all and told his children to go into it with their eyes wide open, one day at a time, and that the situation would not get tense. Adam questioned his father and sister about what would happen if a reformed Claire attempted to seek acceptance for a rehabilitated Jordan. That is not going to happen, Victor insisted. Victoria told Adam that she and Cole had taken Claire to the prison so she could confront Jordan, something Claire needed in order to go forward with her therapy. Victoria revealed that Claire had stated that she was done with Jordan, but Adam was skeptical because Victoria was not present in the room and had not recorded the conversation. Adam indicated that he intended to prove himself to the family through his deeds over time, whereas Claire simply had words. Victoria found Adam's opinion ironic. Adam looked at Victor and said, Dad, you know I'm right. Adam informed Victor that he did not trust anything about the situation. Victoria explained to her brother that what he thought and who he trusted were irrelevant. Nick instructed Adam to let it go. Victoria accused Adam of only caring about Claire taking his place in the family and that they would love Claire more than they loved him. Adam disputed this, but stated that his concern was that the family had not yet heard the end of Jordan and that they would be wise to believe the same way. Adam promised his family that if Jordan ever came out of prison, they'd be his first stop. Nikki walked in and inquired what was going on. Victoria informed her. Apparently, Claire is a threat to Adam's ego. Adam denied it. 
He stated that because he was unsure of the specifics of the event in Oregon, he was concerned about any threats that had been left dangling. Victoria emphasized to her brother that because Claire had been Jordan's victim longer than the rest of the family, they should all be compassionate toward her. Nick told Adam that he had eventually seen things Victoria's way, and Victor instructed Adam to do the same. Adam departed. Claire was handed a phone by a nurse at Memorial Hospital, who informed her that her mother, Victoria, had called her. The nurse left. Claire was taken aback as she put the phone to her ear and heard Jordan speak. Jordan urged Claire to not hang up. Jordan apologized for using deception to get Claire on the phone. Claire tried to be strong. We have nothing else to say to one another. It is over. Claire told her aunt, You're dead to me now. Jordan attempted to convince Claire that the Newmans were not good for her, that they would take her in and destroy her. Claire corrected Jordan and explained that the Newmans wanted her to improve and have a future. Claire scolded her aunt, You've ruined my life. I want you dead. Do you hear me? Dead. And abruptly disconnected the call. Don't leave me, Jordan yelled, but no one was there to hear. Claire gave over the phone to the nurse. Claire instructed the nurse not to take calls from that number in the future. That wasn't my mother. Claire told the nurse, who then inquired, who was on the phone. Claire responded, the devil. Abby and Devin arrived to society, where they noticed Heather and Daniel having lunch. Heather informed Abby and Devin that they were considering Lucy's timetable. Abby commented that they, too, were learning how to manage a child's routine. Abby and Devin exited and sought their own table. Devin gave Heather and Daniel a dubious look as Abby examined her phone. Abby asked Devin whether he really believed it was a good idea to bring her on board. Devin informed her that he thought it was a fantastic idea and that it would be a simple sale because Jill and Lily would see the value in having Abby join them. Abby stated that, while she enjoyed running society, she was looking forward to returning to the corporate sector. Abby told Devon that she had contemplated opening another private dining room in Genoa City, similar to the colonnade room, but that she did not view herself as a restaurateur. Abby told Devon that she didn't want to be pigeonholed in the hospitality industry. Abby stated that she missed being involved in the day-to-day -day activities of the corporate world. Abby told Devon that she felt she had more to give Chancellor Winters than just a vote. Devon looked over at Heather and Daniel, which caught Abby's attention. Abby asked Devon, Okay, what is going on? Nikki informed Victor, Nick, and Victoria about her visit with Claire. Nikki admitted to them that she saw Claire in a new light. Victoria was pleased to hear this. Victor questioned why Nikki had confronted Claire alone. Nikki corrected him. This was not confrontation. It was enlightening, Nikki stated. Nikki added that Claire had opened up about her feelings and anxieties, and that she enjoyed visiting the children's ward to see how the young patients interacted with their family, something Claire had never experienced. Nikki commended Claire's insights and informed her family that they needed to believe Claire would succeed in her objective of filling a void in her heart. Claire was curled up in the fetal position on her bed, shaking. So what do you guys think about this update? Let me know in the comments below. And if you like my videos, please press like and subscribe for more. I'll see you guys next time.